this too. Great. <laughs> Kenji, how are you doing? I'm great. How about you? Good. You always look like you're like living this perfect Pacific Northwest life. Like you've got your pod. <laughs> it's just so amazing. You're usually faced the other direction. So I don't think I've seen those little windows. Is that a one? That's a one room pod, right? Yes, this is a 12 by eight structure. Okay. And um, normally when I'm doing videos, when I'm playing, I'm facing this way. Right. I know I'm used to that direction, but now I'm able yeah. to see how that do you have windows also? Are you facing if you're are you looking at a window also or just the windows? I am. Yeah, I'm looking at little windows that are the same as those windows okay. and the big windows are right here. So normally if I'm filming something, I'll, I'll yeah. have the windows behind me. And I know that you've even spent some um, quality time in there when you had the flu earlier this year. Didn't you get I, like banished to the backyard? I lived, I lived in here for for almost a week. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And um, so when you guys moved here from Brooklyn, it must have been, don't tell me, it was when you guys only had one child, right? So yeah. that must have been 10 years, nine years ago. Eight years, I think. Eight years ago. Yeah, because uh, Emmeline, our daughter, was a year old when we moved here. And, and that's about the same as Jason and I moved from Connecticut when Zippy was six months old also wow. to uh, Corvallis, which is a much smaller town than, than you guys. But um, yeah. somehow having that first child, all of a sudden everything focused and I yep. realized and Jason realized he just wanted trees he wanted so many trees and he wanted to be closer to family and I was like I want to have another kid and I can't be touring yeah like crazy yeah. what what made you guys choose to come back come back because you're from Portland right and Monica's from Seattle is that correct yeah yeah and and what drew us together was um that eventual goal of coming back here at some point and uh, being around the, the trees yeah. uh, and raising a family here and being closer to our, our parents. Mm -hmm. um, and really, that was it. I mean, uh, Emmeline was was a baby. We're in New York City. We lived in Brooklyn. And at some point, we just sort of realized, um, we're, like, why are, why are we still here? We're not doing anything that uh, one lives in the city in order to do. You know, we we can't go out anymore. Yeah, and, uh, right. So, and and things uh, in a, a city with a baby, there are some things that are huge luxuries that are kind of um, available to everyone in other places, mm -hmm. um, like you know, just a backyard or or <laughs> you know something, uh, just having space and. Mm -hmm having a like cute little preschool experience with you know kids who just do art for a couple hours <laughs> yeah stuff that's like great that. and, um, and your house that you chose in portland or, or just south of portland is basically yeah. officially we're still part of portland but it's like basically in northern lake oswego okay and it's a gorgeous house and then you guys converted so you got your own pod in the backyard and Monica converted your garage to a gorgeous piano studio with two. Yeah, two piano two, garage. Two yeah. piano garage. And you guys have do, been doing live stream concerts and all kinds of things. And um, and Kenji, I met you. I somehow wound up at your apartment in Brooklyn at one point, And you had a toilet seat that had like fish in it that had like kind of like floating fish. Does that sound at all familiar? It was like a toilet seat and then the top somehow had like these plastic fish. Does that sound familiar? It was like clear plastic with with goldfish. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's that memory like somehow is like one of those cyclical memories that comes up like every seven weeks. I'm like, oh, that toilet seat. I'm so I glad how you she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm so glad you uh, noticed that and yeah. remember that. That was a stunning, it was a stunning moment. And it's, yeah. And then, um, and then I Kenji, that you, out. I'm so um, happy that we're going to bring the Thunder Egg Consort back together, you and me and Monica and Jason. So we're going to yes. do that again. And it's always so fun to play with you. And I, I had, 
yeah go ahead can i just say one thing about the thunder egg concert I, um that that's like one of my favorite all-time chamber groups and um y you know this this whole time uh in our houses and stuff um it it it's a reminder of what um what we want to get back out there and do and also maybe what i we could start saying no to mm -hmm. and um uh, i i'm so excited to do thunder egg concert again and, and like that's the kind of thing i want to be doing i, I don't want to do just like random mm -hmm. stuff here and there and, and just say yes to everything um I, I want to, like, I, I love the Thunder Egg concert. I love it too. I love it that it's, um, the four of us seem to be kind of on the same, we're both, we're all kind of relaxed and all of us are almost like hands off. We're like, well, what, what do you want to play? What, what, what do you want to play? <laughs> you, what play, what do you want to play? So it's, there's yeah. kind of no one who's the alpha yeah. and everyone's the, it's really fun. And so all the concerts are so eclectic and so relaxed and supportive. So yeah. can't wait for the eggs. Can't wait for the yeah. eggs. <laughs> and um, Kenji, there are two things I was jotting down this morning between the pancake flipping. And um, two things I would love to talk to you about today. I noticed on your uh, Facebook, I guess it was probably six weeks ago, you wrote something like the five skills a musician today should or could have when they go out into the market five things that you don't necessarily learn from music school and i thought that was fascinating and i i'd love to talk about that i'd also love to talk a little bit about stop asian hate and um maybe not how it affects you personally but how you feel it relates to classical music and the asian community or all of us in classical music just i just wanted to throw that out there not necessarily you know maybe just to get your thoughts on that but um totally. does that sound cool to you yeah absolutely okay awesome so tell us the five things do you even remember those five things oh my things? gosh i i don't remember i mean it, it it wasn't like um those are the five right. things it was um they just happened to be five of them and i just thought of those there were skills that um i i didn't uh learn in the conservatory experience but being outside of that i found i i picked up those skills and found them very helpful uh, for the career that i've had mm -hmm. um gosh I, I can't remember what i said um and i was surprised that they seemed to resonate with, with other people i mean that was nice um i i think the the main paradox of the conservatory experience is you you have to uh study the traditional stuff and um you know in order to to have that base level of technique and uh, just that uh, understanding and that vocabulary um and the people who are authorities on that tradition are often um, older generation uh, musicians or teachers. Um, but the the music world is evolving in real time as you know as you're learning this tradition and um, there are there are just some things that that um, kind of education it, it, it's not um, evolving at the same rate as the the world is evolving. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, the, the word conservatory, it, it, it's like preserving something, right? It's, it's not like a progressive Tory. Right. Um, right. <laughs> so, uh, I, one thing, and I don't think I mentioned this as one of those skills, um, but, but one thing that it, it may be in addition to those, and I, I, I got to dig that up somewhere. That, that was a good list. Um, uh, the noticing, uh, recognizing that it's possible to learn from people who are much younger than me. Yeah. Um, and that has helped me a lot too. That that's, I think helped to keep, um, my skill set relevant and, um, useful to, 
to other people, uh, recognizing that um, there are, are people considerably younger than than I am who have uh, way more expertise in a certain kind of thing that would be useful for me to learn about. Yeah. And, and just cool. sort of getting past any uh, kind of ego about, uh, well, I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> so. Um, you know, yeah. um, it's kind of, there's this place called the Marlboro Summer Music Festival, and they, in some ways, have that with the classical format where they have the older generation playing with the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And that's just a lovely, lovely thing. But how do you find cool younger people? Kenji, where do you find those people? <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it's, it's my students. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's messed up that I've, I'm learning more from my students than they learn from me. But, but um, no, I mean, I, I think that's, um, that's important. I mean, I, I, I've taught composition for many years and, um, over that time, I, when I first started, maybe, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of students were coming out who were, were influenced mainly by film music uh -huh. okay. and, and, um, uh, you know, John Williams, but also, uh, younger composers mm -hmm. um a lot of Hans Zimmer and things like that and um that was different from probably 20 years before that there would be a lot of uh, people influenced by um whatever you know new music was going on in the uh, concert world uh and today it's a, a lot of young composers get into it because of video game music yeah and the composers they reference are all these video game composers. It's amazing. And yeah, it, it is. And at, at first I was like, oh, well, haven't you heard blah, 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 symphony by blah. And, and then I, after a while, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Um, why haven't I listened to this video game? Like, I should actually understand that better um, hmm. and, uh, you know, meet my student uh, students where they are um, and uh, so there's there's more of a uh, uh, give and take, and uh, so yeah, I've uh, I it, teaching has in that way helped me continue to learn. That's so cool. Wait, Kenji. Yeah. I was paying attention to the whole thing, but I was also scrolling and finding your original thing. Oh, cool. Hey, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was doing both things. Can I tell you what the list is? Yeah, please. Okay. The ability to, to perform at least five minutes of music by yourself without any sheet music in front of you in any setting without advanced preparation or warm up, at least 30 minutes of music on a week's notice. You know, that one um, I, I, I really think is important. And, and that's in some ways kind of antithetical to the conservatory mindset where uh, you can only perform if you're prepared and, you know, yes. and, and there's so many circumstances where, uh, somebody says, oh, you play an instrument, play something. I know. And then you're like, oh, well this, I need piano for that. And, yeah. uh, oh, this wait, is, only I'm, not an, quite, I'm not quite ready. Oh yeah. No. And uh, I got tired of that. And <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I'm a music, I should be able to just take out my instrument and play something for people. Yes. Yes. And, and so once I decided I was just going to do that, um, that's really helped. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, it, it helps to, um, break down those, those, you know, barriers that, uh, people often perceive with classical musicians and, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so I, I Kenji, can yeah. I ask how that would, okay. So let, let's translate. Okay, let's translate that to like an eight-year-old student, a 12-year-old student, and like a 16-year-old student. So would you say to them, make a uh, copy of your favorite Suzuki piece and fold it up and stick it in your case? Or what, what can a classical, like let's say we're not, we're not as versatile as you, right? We're more uptight. And so, um, I guess I always have like, jammed in the top of my violin case, the Mark O'Connor Appalachian Waltz. And that's like my go-to 
So should everyone, just to start out, just take a piece of music and jam it in the top of their case? Yeah, I mean, what would be uh, even better than that is to uh, take a piece of music and memorize it um, and just play it enough so that you really have it by memory mm -hmm. and so that you can play that thing um, anytime. Uh, okay. And um, and kids can do that, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, with the Suzuki stuff, uh, um, people could. I I bet we could still go back and play some of Book One. Um, oh yeah. With that, you know, uh, like you that that gets in your 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 blood. Yeah. Um, w one interesting thing about uh, fiddling, uh, mm -hmm. having you know, played in a, a bluegrass band for, for a long time. The, the tunes, we, we learned everything by, by ear. And the tunes that I learned with that band, I, I couldn't forget if I tried. I mean, they're, right. they're just like learning by ear somehow mm -hmm. um, hmm. sticks with you. Um, and this, you know, Bach cello suites, I could maybe play a movement yeah. without the music right now. Right, right, right. It's hard. <laughs> I'd have to like really study that. I love this project. So like having to, a piece to play for anyone and then half half an hour of music on a week's notice. That's so that's what I call, I call it the farmer's market challenge. Oh, yeah. I, what if we all challenged ourselves to be able to, it, it doesn't have to be a farmer's market, but right. um, you want to be ready for that so that you can sit down and play for like a half hour mm -hmm. without needing music. Right. Um, and you know, just playing your instrument, yeah, uh, and um, see what happens. And it, that that happened to me at an actual farmers market in in Vermont. Um, they needed someone to fill in for the whoever was supposed to be the music, and so I just showed up with my viola and I made a challenge to myself to just play as long as I could without looking at music. Yeah, and it was so uh, useful. It, it, it was such an interesting experience and it, it really made me want to get better at that it, it, so many things would happen like someone would start talking to me while i'm playing and my first thought was how dare you talk to me i'm playing music like <laughs> can't you see that and i and then realizing well that's crazy why 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 shouldn't i be able to talk, talk to someone time? yeah yeah so um again it's just kind of breaking down that formality you know um I went to college at University of Minnesota um, when I was 16, kind of on the early side, and I had zero dollars. I had no money at all. And I was about, I was like three weeks away from like completely hitting zero. And so I was in an emergency situation. So I, back then, you know, you would check the newspaper for openings. And I saw an opening for um, needing a strolling violinist at Donatelli's All You Can Eat Buffet Wednesday nights on the yeah. outskirts of Minneapolis. And, um, I had my old like rusty brown Volvo diesel and I drove out there for an audition. But before I did that, I went to the music library and I picked out um, all the musicals that I could. And I just memorized, memorized, and then I memorized as many um, like Italian street songs as I could. Awesome. But I still didn't have very many because I only had a couple days notice. So I had maybe like 45 minutes of stuff if I if I looped it. That works. And I just went in there and I just was full of BS. They were like, so tell me about yourself. I was like, I'm 21 years old. I've been uh, doing this for years in Chicago. I can give you my references. <laughs> and what do you want to hear? Finiculi, Finicula or something simpler like Back to Sorrento or something from a musical. <laughs> yeah, and I, I and I got the I got the gig and it paid in cash. And I would get like really skinny during the week. And then on Wednesday, I could eat as much as I and I would just pork out oh, like yeah. crazy and I'd like be sticking buns in my pocket so I was like skinny chunky skinny chunky and um that was a three-hour gig and awesome. it was literally on my feet and those yeah. first uh, six weeks I just f was freaking out because people were asking for uh they would ask they would Requests, like sing yeah. something and yeah. have me play it and, and anyway I did that for two whole years and that paid my rent and that amazing it was the it was the best thing for me. I mean, I'm not again. I'm not versatile like you are, but I got the um, basics down and I got the fear out. And um, that's so uh, that kind of experience is so valuable, um, just in terms of performing uh, and uh, 
having that role of um, of being an entertainer, right? <laughs> and and looking at entertainment not as a kind of dirty word. Like sometimes we in the classical world, it's it's looked down upon to be entertaining right. to or, you know, as if you're like pandering to your audience, right. but you're actually just trying to make them happy. You know, give yeah. them what what they want. And, exactly. And uh, learning to uh, have that um sensitivity and uh, approach it with this kind of service industry um mindset i think is is really valuable that's awesome it's awesome hey kenji we're only supposed to be talking for like two minutes here oh, we're just like going 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 but i love it i love it but i don't want to be taking you away from your dog or your family can I, can I, can I, is it okay if I keep on reading these? Is yeah, this, go for it. am I totally making your day a total bummer? Cause you're like, I was supposed to just go on a huge walk right now. No, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Number two, the ability to speak publicly about yourself, your instrument and what you love about music you're playing an age appropriate way to audiences ranging from preschool to elder care facility. Yeah. You already touched on that a little bit. It's like a, a stretching out of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think it speaks for itself. I think that's awesome. I think that's awesome. I have, I often have my students give me program notes or we work on their bios and I'm like, but you know, would your next door neighbor be able to understand this? You know, yeah. have a basic number three, have a basic understanding comfort level playing with amplification, headphones, earplugs, monitors, click tracks, live electronics, etc., in a variety of venues and the ability to communicate respectfully with a sound engineer on such issues. I can't do this. I can't do this. Kenji, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm like having a heart attack even reading this. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think any of that's going away, right? Um, right. If, if anything, the technology is going to become more integrated into uh, our acoustic world. And I think it's, um, there's there's no use in, in resisting it. It might as well try to get comfortable uh, with some of that. And, um, and once, once you do it, it, it does become just another part of the whole, um, it, it's like an extension of your instrument to be able to um, know how to, you know, EQ your sound if you're amplified and um, uh, how to, if you need to have some kind of monitor, like uh, a way to figure that out. Um, and you know it's 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 always um i've had plenty of experiences of creating um painful ear splitting feedback uh in, in, and just there's nothing more humiliating than that like yes i'm the guy who just caused yes uh, you know this traumatic experience for all of us um so so it's it, it, i i think there's there's value in and uh, learning a little about that stuff. So Kenji, I know a teensy bit about some of those things that you're talking about, but how would you advise me, like as a mom of two in her forties, how can I figure out more about that so I can share that knowledge? Like, I wanna make sure my students are behind the times. How can, what can I do? Well, um, you know, there are, there's a lot of stuff you can, uh, you know, without having to invest in a ton of equipment, you, you can learn about, um, I mean, there, there's a, a lot of stuff online, like, um, that string players specifically, uh, who use electronics and amplification, a lot of resources there to kind of, uh, get, um, introduced to, to that. Um, and then, uh, just like simple stuff with, a. uh, a mic or a pickup um, and, and an amplifier to, to start messing around. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is something that, that kids who, like guitarists, were all kids sitting in their bedroom when they were 13, you know, with a bunch of pedals and an electric guitar and an amp. And, and yeah. so it's, it's been from a pretty early age, something that, that's just a part of their, how they produce sound. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so we, we don't have that, um, history with electronics, but, uh, we, we can get there. It's, it's not, um, 
it's not as intimidating as it might seem at first. I think one of the great things about um, Zoom lessons and virtual learning this year is now that basically all my students can do GarageBand or Audacity and a bunch of them started podcasts and yeah. we can do acapella, but it's pretty basic. We're pretty basic. So maybe the next step is we all need to get what kind of pickup should I get? Is it called? I used to have a Fishman pickup way back in when I was in college. Is, should we all be getting a just a simple pickup and uh, amplifier or what should we be getting to go to the next step? Um, that depends on on what kind of playing you want to do. Um, there are a lot of instruments that have kind of a built in um, acoustic electric system, like a, a built in pickup. Uh, you can get uh, their LR bags makes a bridge pickup. Uh, you, you replace the bridge on your instrument with this one and mm -hmm. it's got a, a pickup inside it. Okay. Um, I use mainly a clip on microphone. Uh, okay. Uh, it's a deep the company's DPA, um, they make this little microphone, uh, but it depends on what you want to do. I, I'm not using like distortion and things like that. If you want to use like real rock kind of sounds, you need probably a solid body electric instrument. Right. Um, and those are, are much more common these days. So the price has dropped a lot and, okay. and they're more, um, accessible for a lot of uh, players. So. If that if somebody's like really interested in that kind of music, uh, mm -hmm. there, there are ways to get into it without uh, having the cost be too big of a barrier. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's number four. Are you ready? Yeah. The ability to create your own. You're such an excellent writer. And look at your. Wait, let's see your. Let's see your Pacific Northwest mug. Here's mine. Oh, nice. This is a, a Polish pottery oh. place uh, up on, uh, on 23rd Street. Yeah. Nice, nice. Mm. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The ability to create your own instrumental contribution to a group texture without having all the notes written out for you by someone else. This combines improvising and arranging skills with ear training and an understanding of genre. That also scares me. I mean, I don't, if I went in, if I did that, I think I would have palpitations even walking into that situation. And I would just feel like I would start sweating and I would be frozen probably. And then if I did start making any kind of noise on my instrument, it would be wrong. It would be totally wrong and everyone would know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, um, that's an important thing about this list. And I think I mentioned something about that. Um, I didn't uh, acquire any of these skills without some kind of humiliating failure, <laughs> uh, not being able to uh, to do the stuff. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I'd be in a situation where I had to to play over a changes on a chord chart and and i'd like bomb it and um and then i would think i i don't want to do that again i want to be able to do this without dragging everything down oh, um, yeah. so what do i have to so you know just uh, figure out what it is that you need to learn in order to be able to do that okay and yeah but um, yeah, okay, okay. This is inspiring. I'm, 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 I'm thinking. I'm thinking, and I'm thinking of ways that I can expand my, my world. Well, this it's is... hard because you know our our whole training is to perfection. Um, yeah, it's to 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 be as accurate and uh, as possible, and and to take pride in being able to perform at the highest level you can, and yeah. and um, mm -hmm. be recognized for that, and. Uh, the thought of uh, being mediocre or terrible in public uh, becomes, uh, you know, we get further and further away from that. And so it becomes scarier uh, yeah. to, yeah. to think of having that happen again. And um, I think getting past that and recognizing that it, um, just as we put a lot of work into being able to do this one thing, well, all it takes is work to to develop these other skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay. I'm still a little scared, but I'm, 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 <laughs> it's just so good for me to hear. Okay. Number five, understanding. Oh, I love this one. This one was brilliant. And as I was reading this, I was like cycling through not your toilet seat with the fish in it, but a number of other things in my life where I had not picked up the signals. And I was such an idiot. Listen to this. This is brilliant. Understanding your role on the spectrum of creative ownership of a project. Sometimes you need to be in charge and make decisions. Other times, your job is to follow someone else's directions as best you can without inserting your own ideas or vying for the center of attention. Often, it's somewhere in the middle. Learn to identify this early on in the process. Right now, I'd like to apologize to everybody I have ever <laughs> worked with in my entire life that I was so insensitive and I did, totally did not pick up on this and I did everything like just the opposite. I'm so sorry, everybody. Except for the Thunder Egg concert. Except for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, um, yeah, I thought about that one. And uh, um, that's, that's really it, right? Like, um, in, in any, it doesn't matter what kind of music it is. It, 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 chamber music, it happens all the time. Just like, um, understanding you know, whose gig this is and um, what you're there to do. And, uh, and, and I've made the mistake on both sides of it. Sometimes I, it, I could have stepped up more and been more of uh, a leader and I should have. Um, and, uh, and other times I, I should have just chilled out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. That's, this is brilliant, brilliant advice. And the sooner we, recognize that and learn it the better yeah. for all parts of life for all every single part like am i aggressively bagging my own groceries when the guy at trader joe's yeah. <laughs> obviously wants to earn his money doing that and yeah. wants to provide that and i'm like no 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 <laughs> you know like okay yeah. so this is great can we possibly segue into something which is talking about or me listening to stop Asian hate through, like, I'd love to look at classical music through that lens somehow. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm not sure how you would want to talk about it, but I guess a couple of the ingredients could be that um, being in classical music, um, the mixture of cultures is, is, um, pretty wide in terms of Asian and uh, what do I say, European centric performers. And it's really a part of all of our upbringing. And, um, and how does that how what is our responsibility? What is how does um, Asian racism, racism against Asians? How does that all pertain to us? What does it mean? Can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's it, that's a really good question because it's um, it, it's such a a, a different uh, it's so different from our uh, general um, demographic makeup, right? Um, here in Oregon, it's an overwhelmingly white community um, with. Uh, a, relatively small Asian, I mean, in the whole country, the, the Asian population is, is very small. Um, but in classical music, it's quite significant. Um, and so, so that's really different. And I, when I went to music school, um, and actually, frankly, in high school, when I joined the um, Youth Philharmonic, the Portland Youth Philharmonic here, uh, it I didn't really realize it at the time, but I, I felt comfortable there. At, and I think it's because I saw people who looked more like me. And, uh, you know, of course, we have this shared interest of music, but there are a lot of Asians there, too. And the same when I, I went off to to uh, college, um, th there there's a significant Asian uh, percentage of, of musicians who are Asian. Um, even so, there, there's um, 
the same uh, kind of microaggressions that that you find, and and that's a a sort of more recent term that that I think not everyone is comfortable with. Um, if if you're part of the um, dominant culture, uh, in this case, white. Uh, uh, you know, Euro European culture, um, it's hard to understand how microaggressions are, uh, can, can be, uh, sort of toxic and, and it's, um, it's not that the, each one of them is a devastatingly hurtful experience. It's just, um, uh, you know, it's just somebody picking at a scab, you know, every day over and over. So it never, it's a wound that never heals and just kind of mm -hmm. festers. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, there's, it's been an interesting year with, with the, you know, this huge surge in the violence uh, and um, hate against Asians. And it's, it's been, um, you know, when we talk about Asians, it's like this vast uh, sea of different cultures and, uh, and that have often very little to do with each other. Mm -hmm. But if we were to make one generalization um, across a lot of Asian cultures, you see this uh, a similar uh, interest in not um, complaining about uh, what's happening to you, but sort of accepting, uh, there's, there's this, uh, kind of acceptance of your circumstance and trying to make the best of it. Um, mm -hmm. you see that in a lot of different Asian, um, culture and, and so, uh, there hasn't historically been a, a big voice against, um, the, the prejudice, um, but that's changing now and it's interesting and, and people are, are, recognizing and calling out um the the little things the the microaggressions and and i think that's important because um you know it's it's easy to to say oh look this person was punched for no reason on the street um and it's easy to see that and say oh i would never do that to anybody i'm not a racist i'm you know mm -hmm. um but it, it's it, it's harder to um uh, see an Asian person and think, oh, you must know so-and-so, you'd, uh, you'd yeah. be great friends, uh, you have a lot in common, <laughs> just because they're two Asian people, uh, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Assumptions and, and small comments, I see yeah. that. Yeah, I remember my freshman year at, at Juilliard, um, a, I got in an ele elevator with a very uh, famous piano teacher, just the two of us. And I sort of nodded hello. And, and then he's just talking to me about some Beethoven sonata. I'm like, well, what the hell are you talking about? And, and, and then, um, I, I didn't, like he could see I was, was confused mm -hmm. and he just sort of looks at me for a while. And then we, we get to another floor and then he realizes I'm not his student. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> it's like, oh, sorry, <laughs> or something. Like, <laughs> cool, man. Um, do you think that? Um, what do you What do you think about Asian bias in classical music? Do you think it's it's Does it affect people getting jobs? Does it affect you? You're saying it affects people's treatments treatment of people but what what about professionally how do, how do you feel about um classical music professionally well you know the, the, there's a this persistent uh perception of asians as being like somehow emotionally inscrutable and um right. <laughs> uh detached right. uh, from uh, and and so the um the trope that comes out of that is, uh, well, it's technically flawless, but so cold and uh, unemotional. Yeah. And yes, I've heard that a lot. Of course, I've heard that a lot. Yeah. 
and like why is that that we're only hearing that about the asian players yeah. and you know i i would love to be more flawless i'm like <laughs> so yeah. far from that um so what do you but, can you unpack that a little bit i mean how does that affect players all of us how does that affect us and, and why what's up with that um it's it, it can, I think, certainly be become a barrier to, um, I mean, I, I have a friend who's been pointing that out in, in the world of opera, how there are these uh, wonderful Asian singers who aren't getting cast in roles because okay. of how they look, um, yeah. because it's not believable that, uh, mm. you know, you could wow. have an Asian Rodolfo or something. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and uh, you know, that's not cool. Um, it was certainly in in uh, drama in in uh, film and TV that's long been the case that yes. uh, Asians are only cast uh, in certain um, stereotypical roles. Right. Um, as as musicians, it, you know, it's accepted to be um, uh, an Asian string player that or an Asian pianist. We, yes. We're used to seeing that and. Yeah. Um, uh, but even even then th that there there are um, s other instruments that are are less uh, um, you know people are we're not as comfortable seeing Asian people play different instruments or mm -hmm. different kinds of music mm -hmm. um, and you know being creative and funny and fun and and um, joyful and th things like that are uh those aren't um traits that are uh, you know no race has cornered the market on that that's <laughs> that's, for sure. that, so, that's for sure that's for sure kenji do you feel like um it's going the right right direction in classical music do you think it's starting to loosen do you think it's starting to be more open oh absolutely i i think so and it, i i think just the fact that these discussions are Mm -hmm. are, um, coming out now and people are actually talking about this I, I think is so helpful mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know Monica and I talk about this we, we never were um, I mean even until we moved out here we were sort of oblivious to all of that and mm -hmm. um, just because you 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 just want to like push it away and um, pretend it's not there yeah and you know do your thing and uh, think that that it's it's all okay and and uh, it's only been more recently that we've understood our responsibility and kind of um standing up and saying stuff and and the modeling for our kids mm -hmm. um you know trying to as we send them to school and they're overwhelmingly white um community right. uh we we want them to uh feel uh pride and their mm -hmm. heritage and and um, feel comfortable uh, expressing that and being themselves and so mm -hmm. uh, yeah just trying to be part of the solution I guess what can I do to be part of the solution or what can we do can you tell us what we need to do tell me what I need to do you know you know what you need to do you're, you're doing it you're you're asking questions and you're listening to answers and um, that is just so uh, so valuable and and so appreciated when um, people who are white uh, make the space for that. You know, they ask ask the question and and actually listen. Uh, you know, um, and historically that that hasn't happened. It, it, um, there's been, uh, you hear a lot about the invisibility of the Asian experience and, and um, it's, it's been easy to be sort of invisible um, and, and that's changing now and it requires not, you know, the, the onus isn't just on us to speak up about this, it's to, for, uh, for other people to actually listen. Yeah. Well, Kenji, there's no one I'd rather listen to than you with whatever you're going to do or play or talk about. And um, 
this has been such an excellent um, inside chat. It's just lovely. And I can't wait to have you back at Inside Music Academy because you're just a fountain of love and information and entertainment and welcomeness. And you teach us how to open our minds Whatever you do, every week you tell us something different, whether it's learning how to um, figure out how to Im do a little improvisation, playing something for us, showing us your fearlessness or your open mindedness to all different kinds of music. And um, I can't thank you enough for spending a part of your valuable family time in your gorgeous pod there talking to us. And um, Oh my gosh, I just can't wait to see you in person. But in the meantime, it's been lovely to see you in our Zoom space. And it feels just almost as warm. It's like it's like Kenji, but minus the smell. <laughs> you know? So there's there's only just a little bit more I need. I just need a little bit of the aroma and then my 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 experience would be complete. Yeah. You know what oh. I'm saying? And I'm sure it's mutual because I I have not worn deodorant in a whole year. I don't know about you, but I just like gave up on it. That's so great. I wow. love it. Yeah. My family complains. <laughs> but anyway. Um, oh my gosh, it's so Kenji, good to talk to you. It's great to talk to you. Thank you so much. I know this is really important uh, family time for you. So I'm going to let you go. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm super excited for Inside Music Academy. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.